In the mid-19th century, Australia was experiencing a gold rush. Uh, the Australian government understood that they needed to run a telegraph line from Melbourne to the East Indies, essentially connecting them to the rest of the world. Uh, enter Robert Burke and William John Wills, uh, Burke and Wills, a crackpot team of people who have never been to the, the Great Outback, yet wanted to uh, claim the legacy of, of, uh, of connecting Australia via the telegraph uh, during their day. Uh, uh, Burke was uh, an Irish policeman, uh, Wills uh, was a surgeon, um, and yet they, uh, they were commissioned to lead uh, this uh, team of explorers <laughs> into the wilderness on a 2,000 mile journey uh, up north to, uh, to, to begin laying that telegraph line. From the outset, it seems uh, their inexperience uh, and, and ambitions got the better of them. They were carrying uh, quite the baggage. They had uh, 20 tons of goods and uh, much of what they had was uh, uh, kind of unnecessary if, uh, if you're trying to uh, to embark on a 2,000 mile journey on foot. Uh, they carried things like Chinese gongs, heavy wooden tables with matching chairs, um, and, uh, and high quality grooming sets for their horses. Uh, gotta, gotta keep those haircuts tight <laughs> while you're out in the desert. Within days, um, men were squabbling. Six of their party quit. Uh, and decided that this was not going to end well, and uh, and and they departed, realizing the 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 snail's pace at which they were uh, they were moving. They decided to start offloading some of their goods, uh, including 1,500 pounds of uh, sugar uh, just left by the wayside. Uh, they crossed uh, 400 miles, uh, the first 400 miles of the journey in two months' time. Uh, they rested at a hotel kind of regrouped, uh, recalibrated, and continued on with the journey, um, uh, making another 400 miles in another two months. Uh, they decided to uh, to make camp at a place called Cooper Creek. Uh, and uh, because the pace had been so burdensome, uh, Burke and Wills decided just to set out with uh, three men uh, to head to the Gulf of Carpentaria, near the northernmost part of their journey, where they could sort of uh, begin laying that telegraph line back. Um, so uh, so they gave instructions to the men that they were leaving behind with most of their provisions to wait three months for them. And if in three months time they didn't return to carry on or uh, abandon ship. It took two months to reach the Gulf. Uh, and when they got there, they couldn't even see the shoreline. A thicket of mangrove trees uh, was, uh, was obscuring their ability to get all the way to the coastline. Uh, they'd been through two thirds of their rations, and so uh, getting back was uh, was was perilous to uh, Cooper Creek. They insisted that they make it back anyway, and uh, one of their men dropped dead along the way. They were nearly starved to death by the time they returned, but they returned to Cooper Creek to find a note uh, carved in a kulaba tree uh, that said that very morning the team had departed, that they could no longer wait uh, for the men to return, and they'd given up. Uh, Wills and Burke long story short, ended up dying, uh, trying to reach a police outpost. The only survivor was a man named John King from their expedition. Um, it cost uh, several lives, uh, 60,000 pounds investment. It accomplished nothing. It was a useless, useless expedition. I feel like this is not just the story of Burke and Wills. I feel like this is the story of many of our lives. It's a really interesting one because, you know, for most of us, uh, we pour great expense into the endeavors that we busy ourselves with. Uh, we, we put great effort into it. And sometimes we think the struggle itself is proof that we're on the right track. But we can learn from Burke and Wills that that's not at all true. And I think we can talk about what scripture has to say about the journeys that we're on that are useful or whether or not we're on a useless journey. We can find a couple red flags in the Burke and Wills journey uh, that stand out. And uh, I'm sure we could talk about this all day, but one of the first that we recognize is excess. And, and, and maybe uh, excess in our lives is a good, a good red flag that perhaps the way that we're going about our journey is a hindrance rather than a help. What does scripture say about excess? We can look to the life of Christ and how he sent his uh, disciples out. It says this, heal the sick, Raise the dead, cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Don't take any money in your money belts. No gold, silver, or even copper coins. Don't carry a traveler's bag with a change of clothes and sandals or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality. 
because those who work deserve to be fed. Again, Matthew 10, 8 through 10. The amount of faith that Christ demands of us for us to partake in the real journeys that matter, that make use of our time here on earth, require nothing, nothing but a dependency on each other's, uh, the love that exists in the world, uh, the, the, the universal sense of goodness, uh, uh, in large part that, that we all share, and trusting in that, and trusting that God will provide. Um, so we find something startlingly different when we study the pages of Scripture about excess in our lives. And I think, uh, again, the Burke and Will story is a good example of how costly it can be to walk around with the gongs and the wooden tables with matching chairs that matter very little to the journey, journey itself. We can also look at relational decay. Relational decay is a painful one. And oftentimes we work so hard to justify our own behaviors and actions that we explain away uh, or point fingers when we see relational decay around us. I've got friends in my own life now that are becoming something else, that are uh, on a slippery slope uh, towards a different kind of life than, uh, than God really recognizes as useful. And the, the, the relationships that are in the, the wake of their movement are just, um, they're drowning and uh, it's painful to see. So relational decay is a big one. Six members of Burke and Will's party uh, evaporated uh, just within days. And I think that's a sign when that kind of thing is happening, of something wrong. That, that, that we can trust and rely on the community around us to, to sort of inform us of when we're not on a path that's going to end well. Utter exhaustion is another big one, and I have definitely experienced this. The first time I ever experienced real depression was three or four years ago. Um, that left me completely destitute emotionally and internally and spiritually, and I thought there was nothing left, nothing left to live for. And, um, you know, I, 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 I've talked about this, but I, I still struggle reconciling who I am now and to who I was, it's hard to understand that sometimes, but I was exhausted because I thought if I got to the top of whatever mountain I chose to make a goal, that there would be something there fulfilling or satisfying, but all I found was it was fatigue. And that was a painful, that was painful to reconcile with it. Once I, once I was at the top of my mountain, there was nothing there, um, nothing there. And, and I had to recalibrate and take inventory of what was truly meaningful and pivot. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was utter exhaustion on this. People were dropping dead. And uh, while there are things worth sacrificing ourselves for in this life, often uh, the, the journey that God has for us is not one that leaves us utterly destitute as far as our energy levels go. Uh, there is a balance to our life. He wants us to enjoy where he's put us in the world. Enjoy the community that we have. Eat, break bread with people, celebrate life, enjoy nature, and uh, work hard with our hands. So there's a balance to that. And if we're just utterly exhausted, red flag, we're on the Burke and Wells trail. I think there's also another way to look at this, which is uh, the importance of taking inventory in our own life to see whether or not we're useful and understand the spiritual perspective of um, how God views uh, the fruit of our life. Jesus, again, tells a powerful parable. And one that the first time I heard it burned so deeply in me, I've never forgotten it. I keep it at the forefront of my mind. I want to share it with you. He says this, A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Christ is a man checking for the fruit on that tree. And he's patient for a time, for years, years, years. Until at some point he realizes there is no good fruit from this tree. And I, I, I no longer want the, the, the healthy soil to, to consume the nutrients, the common grace that's talked about there, which is available to everybody only during this time on earth. Hell is a, a world where common grace is removed and we continue to get what we want, which is to be the kings of our own lives. But when common grace is removed, the blessing in God, the, the face of God who turns to both uh, the good and evil, uh, we are left completely alone. And that's a terrifying thing, but really it's just God giving us what we want. We like to gripe about how what good God can, uh, can, can create a place like hell. He's just created a place where he is no longer pouring into the, uh, his, his healthy uh, nutrients into the soil that is not going to produce a crop anyway because it doesn't want to. 
so he hands us over to our own desires. Um, but if there is fruit on that tree, he will continue to nurture that. And in fact, he talks about grafting us into the root, the divine ground that has eternal power to keep us sustained and healthy and vibrant. We are one uh, with that body, uh, that kingdom of uh, the citizen, uh, citizenry of, of heaven. And, uh, and, and, and there's an, an eternal fountain of living water that can sustain that root because it's God himself. So we need to tap into that kind of ground. We need to produce fruit in our life uh, to make ourselves useful. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. How do we make our lives useful, full of fruit? Something that when Christ comes around to check on our trees, he sees something that makes him want to pour more into the, the soil around the roots. It's to seek ye first the kingdom of God and the things of God and the fruitfulness of God and everything else will work out. The journey will align with uh, the plans that God has for us, his best plan for our lives and, and all else uh, will uh, will be cared for and nurtured by uh, by the spirit of one who loves life and and seeing that born in our world. Uh, much love, happy Sunday to you. Thanks for watching.